to me my apologies for 35 minutes into our call i forgot to turn on the recorder earlier keep going Stuart. no worries to me you know the idea of using ai um yes in certain narrow ways perhaps but not as globally um as 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 klaus is um for his particular um neo book so i just wanted to throw those ideas out there and the idea of a living book is something that I, I could get really excited about. How much I would want to run um, my book through um, AI, I'm just I'm just not sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, sure. Thanks. One of the things that strikes me is that one of the ways of seeing neo books is that all these different features are add-ons, optional add-ons. Yeah. Like, hey, maybe you'd like to maybe you'd like to print a book. That's an optional add-on. Yep. The corpus, the corpus of work that's alive is the interesting artifact. Mm -hmm. uh, it, that it sprouts, that it sprouts different things that we can then manifest in the world is a is a cool set of features. And one of those things would be a GPT gateway that knows how to talk to the corpus, simplifying the process for muggles. Yep. Um, but everybody doesn't have to do that. Yeah. Uh, what I also wanted to say was, you know, Jerry, you suggested that you've got two big projects you're working on and, you know, and they're, they're, you know, diluting your focus, I think, or, you know, maybe, maybe it would be a good idea to, um, to kind of suspend the calls until you're ready to, you know, fully engage. Um, that strikes me it might be a good thing because it's I think it's frustrating for us to spend time here and not have a lot of progress. I'm frustrated because I'm like, I I, I feel you guys, um, and, but I love this project and I really want to make progress on it. So I, I think I, I need to sort out the things that I need to get done. Uh, so what we could do is we could hold a month's worth of Monday calls. Uh, Rick, if you wanted to invite Kent to join us at any Monday that's convenient for him on our regular schedule, or we could figure out some other time that's more convenient for him either way. But then we could convene just to have a conversation around Kent in the middle of that. And that would be fine uh, because that would be our purpose. Uh, but if we want to hold off for a bit, I'm good with that. That actually helps me a bunch. Well, it, it, yeah, I, I was going to say, you know, I can live with that. No problems. Uh, the thing that I'm actually interested in is where people bring some of the writing or something where we can, discuss it uh obviously you know that would have to wait but you know um you know i mean for example Stuart, the stuff that you did on collaboration i'm sure it's still in the in the background you can what did i learn from that experience that would actually enable us to be able to you know what what would make a difference to create these learning communities based upon living books have you given much thought to that <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the very short response is <laughs> to not get too excited and make sure you understand who it is that you're intending to collaborate with and, and their own internal capacity for what are yeah. called collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So choose wisely, in other words. But yeah. <laughs> well, it, com it comes back to the it comes back to the avatar and where is the avatars that are interested uh, and the things we're talking about. I mean, I think there is a lot of interest, actually, with all the wicked problems going on. There's so many organizations out there that are, you know, working on this. And the question is, can you actually compile a list of organizations and and see whether those organizations are, you know, potential, um, you know, customers down the road if they buy into the, the Neo book, you know, idea that it would actually enhance their learning communities. I mean, just just take David, for example. I mean, you know, he just popped off. But, you know, GRC, I mean, um, you know, for me, GRC is, is, is uh, let's say, um, it could enhance its learning process, to, to put it briefly. And I think we have to become more sophisticated in how we design our learning processes to be able to, uh, you know, do the sort of transformational learning that we all know what's needed. But so difficult to do. Um, and Rick, I just want to go back to what you said a moment ago, which is I think it sounds like you'd love us to use this time to workshop our writings with each other. It's an element of it. If that's what people want to do. I mean, I, right. I you know, I've belonged to writing groups before. I always find them incredibly helpful. Um, 
you know, where you actually, you know, share something, a few paragraphs or something and or a concept um, and get critique from people's different perspectives. Which would be fine. I just want to get an uh, enthusiasm reading from anybody else on the call because we can do that <laughs> in other settings. We don't have to use this call for it. But if we would like to do that, that'd be great. The one the one problem that raises is if the if the pieces are long, it take it takes a pretty pretty big investment in time to be a good workshopper and to commit to reading other people's pieces along the way. Um, that, that's the only kind of barrier I can think of. But I don't know how, how anybody else feels like uh, about. We could take turns on the calls and, you know, we could alternate calls and say, hey, it's uh, it's Stuart's turn. Uh, and we could start with an, uh, the germ of an idea or a couple of paragraphs or something larger. Then we have to figure well, maybe out maybe a page, page or two, maybe, you know, max five minutes reading. But it's for the generative fees or if, if it's a conceptual paper of something yeah. that's going to be much larger, like neobooks, then, you know, I mean, you could present. I know you've already presented it, but I haven't, you know, um, seen it myself so i mean you know that's that's to me the obvious one um is to is, is to critique the, the framework of the neo books that you've already been working on and whatever stage it's at and that's the my third project so if i get these two cleared off that's the, the, the third thing <laughs> well, i'm going to turn my attention to yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm quite, I'm quite happy to take a break for a few weeks if that fits yours. I, I'm, you know, yeah. um, I, I'm attracted to the ideas of, you know, of what, how technology can enable this to make it easier to do. Um, and I mean, there's so many different avenues for that. Um, so I'm just an open book trying to say, okay, well, you know. Um, Ooh, open book. Wanted. That sounds like it's related. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'm. I'm I'm attracted to the idea that we've got a whole bunch of really great minds that are thinking about stuff that that's important, and how is it we can, um, you know, create the the the, the portal, the context, um, for a getting the ideas out and b enhancing them in whatever way technology might a, a assist with that. Mm -hmm. Um, Klaus, how do you feel about workshopping kind of activity for us? No, I mean I'm 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 game. Um, maybe we can uh, introduce a synopsis of our writing, you know, instead of uh, having a full article. Um, yeah, I mean I tell you, uh, I'm 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 so glad I have a pension and and I don't have any financial issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I think the idea of workshopping. Um, it, the ideas is important. Um, I've been workshopping my ideas with, you know, with 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 writing contacts that I have, you know, outside of this group for a few years, and I'm just ready to um, to move forward with it. Um, that's just my personal stance at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Jose. I'm going to guess that you'd rather we lock down the foundations of neobooks and get more of the protocols and other kinds of things in place than work on each other's one another's content but i'm not sure what do you have any thoughts yeah i think uh it takes a little bit of both right like you we we need to get those things lined up i think those would be essential and the role of ai in those things as well i think the conversation today at the creation level, as well as the dissemination level. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think very importantly at the creation level, not just with content and, um, you know, access to information that we generally don't have in our own brains. Uh, and, and it requires a lot of work to, to, to resource that information. But uh, to have a neo book protocol model of what a nugget is and how a nugget works and what makes a nugget a nugget and da, da 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 If that's built in to an AI tool that would help us write neo books, then I think then it it does what I was kind of describing with that spreadsheet a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, it it could do that work, and we're not actually doing that that manual work of of doing that. Uh, to create. So, so yes, that would be my primary focus. I think the idea of 
uh, workshopping content could be taken offline, meaning a second meeting where people want to do that, or done here periodically with, in my mind, with the intention of informing the kinds of questions and answers we need to arrive at for the modeling of, of the platform. Um, um, to me, that, that would be very helpful, I think. But not purely, I mean, for both functions, for the, mm -hmm. the content aspect, to, to help each other with the content, but also to understand how do we look at this from a, a block, uh, uh, sorry, I keep saying block, um, from a nugget perspective, what is mm -hmm. what is this nugget? How does this nugget look like? What could we do to to manipulate this nugget? Um, to me, to me, it would be uh, a loss of uh, uh, an opportunity if we're only looking at it for the content purposes and the writing purposes. Yeah, I think that we're not saying to replace our calls with all workshops, but but you know some some. Uh, some workshopping content. Uh, what you just said makes me realize that um, the workshopping that we're talking about is also or could also be an incredibly important aspect of making the nuggets l alive. Like if these are meant to be living books, then one of the things that living book communities do is they workshop the content. Uh, and they do so using some of the you know, here we're talking about uh, more of a Zoom workshop that would smell a lot like a traditional writer's workshop. But if we do this right, because we're, we're using wiki-like tools, then there's also other ways to, of doing the workshopping um, that would be super interesting. So, and 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 this, I think, also is um, pointing in the in the direction of some kind of editorial policy, um, which I think is 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 needed. You know, not not to be exclusionary in some ways but more about you know what kind of stuff that we're really looking for and want to um put out and disseminate i think we need something like that i don't know if there was if, if there was anything in the in the you know um the language of the, the the agreement that we did at some point in time about editorializing i think i think we pointed in in in, in the direction um in terms of the kinds of stuff that we wanted to um to publish you mean the generative commons agreement? No, the agreement Our... that I facilitated that we did. Oh, okay. In the in the Google Doc. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. 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 Rick, you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think there's two domains, and one is focusing on the content, and the other is the learning process, and actually. Um, I think I, I just put something in the chat that I just took from a blog there um, and to give an example of, of uh, you know, how we need to think about learning differently. And I mean, that question is a complex one. Uh, it's a journey without end. Um, and, you know, there's a link there to to initiate people's experience of using perplexity AI and they can go and read it and whatever. But it's 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 adding more questions into the mix and looking at how you can gather different inputs both ai and others in such a way that you can improve the output of what you're trying to work on um so i mean that is that that there we could we could simply discuss that for example uh as a as a mini thing whether you call it a nugget or whatever um but focusing on because i think just focusing on the content without looking at the learning process closely, um, you know, you're not going to, you you know, knowledge transfer is easy, but, <laughs> well, not necessarily, but it's easier than trying to implement it. Let's put it that way. I mean, so this is just an example of one learning strategy of how to engage people to think about uh, working together and going deeper into a particular topic. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a really interesting exercise when you uh, when you uh, uh, solicit or uh, a, uh, a response from the AI because um, you get back what you put in, right? And and you realize on the response that you get that 
you forgot to put certain things, certain elements into the equation. So I typically start by feeding data into the AI about the topic I'm I'm interested in, and then ask it to create a summary of what I just gave it. And then on the summary, I can see there are gaps, so I feed more data. And then once I have that process aligned, then I'm asking the question that I'm really interested in. But you, you so in and by itself, the AI will not give you uh, uh, any sensible response. So then that gets you further you know, to, to hand a chatbot to somebody um, that is actually useful, it takes a lot of preparatory work and framing. You know, this is not just automatically useful. Um, so it's this, this kind of, but once you have it, it's amazing. Right. I mean, once this thing uh, flows, then you get uh, absolutely amazing responses. So it's this um, this idea of concierge. You would have to train someone you know, how this works uh, to then become an interluder with with an actual user. Because, like in in my industry, people are just not sad, not tech savvy enough to really. Uh, you know, to really take advantage of this technology. And chances are they're getting frustrated because the kinds of responses that you get without having the AI prepped up properly are just uh, nonsense or they're disappointing. You know? Which is partly why I was talking about having different portals for different audiences for you, Klaus. And also the word concierge, I don't think would work for a farmer at all. Yeah, I think you, it needs to be a guide. Like they don't have concierges. They don't ever want a concierge in their life. The word concierge, the concept is a phenomenal concept. It needs to be packaged differently for the farmer, I think. It's your dude, yeah. <clears throat> exactly. It's, it's your dude you can ask questions of. <clears throat> so, um, well, that. you know, just, just uh, there's another dimension to what you were just alluding to there, Klaus, which is, developing the AI skills to be able to use AI effectively. And, you know, how would you workshop exactly what you just said and demonstrate, um, you know, those those skill sets that you, or you're currently using and developing? I mean, I'm just using, and I'm just playing around with it and looking, well, you can just do academic journals, you can do the web, you can do uh, YouTube, you know, you can select the options and then you can put the domains of, of um you know, the disciplines that you want to focus on. I mean, there's all those nuances. Um, and, you know, you just change the question a little bit or you can delete the some of the references that are relevant, rerun it and come, it'll rewrite it based upon the the uh, the, the references that were deleted because they weren't strictly relevant to what your interest is. I mean, there's all those, uh, and I'm just, I'm just winging it myself. Um, and I'm just wondering... <laughs> Well, the question is, who's got the best winging, winging learning program out there? You know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the way I envision that to go forward in the in the short to medium term is that you you will find influencers. So, for example, my daughter is interested. And she's a cancer survivor, and she's very creative. She's a web designer and all this. So she is interested in taking this health uh, 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 GPT. You know, because she, uh, she had her personal experiences from surviving cancer sort of put her into a special frame. So she, as, as she is an influencer, she can solicit people to join her group. Um, she can then make that that GPT available, but she can also teach classes to uh, or, or have a, a, a weekly forum, for example, where people can come with questions. And she can update it. And as more people are using the GPT, it gets smarter, right? Because it learns as uh, through the question process. But I think that's that's sort of the the influencer role, you know, th that uh, that will have to manage that. That's the only practical way I can see this work for 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 right now. Um, and and uh, I would love to find you know, someone who wants to take on this. TSP technical service provider all here because that's you know obviously I mean a huge job creation program they're looking for three thousand you know people these are uh, uh, very well paying jobs you know um, 
but you again you need a trainer you know in in uh, helping people understand this it feels to me class in in, in healthcare in particular if, if you know influencer about cancer for example um this gets really complicated in interesting ways really quickly uh one thing is there's a bunch of good and bad cancer advice, including, hey, don't do treatments, just do naturopathy or whatever else. And there's a bunch of junk uh, cures and, and so forth that are out there that are in the space that was fed into the devices. Maybe, I don't know. But giving medical advice is a very, very thorny thing in, in the US and is under a whole bunch of uh, legislation. But right next door is how do you do good nutrition for your body? Right next door is a, a body that I discovered when I was trying to get my mom through the healthcare system, <clears throat> which is how the hell do you make your way through the healthcare system? Do you, we need an ombudsman. We need a guide. We need like a bullshit detector. We need uh, good advice in very, very hard situations. Uh, sometimes you come upon end of life decisions that you're not equipped to make. Uh, and if you're not you know, fortunate enough to get a great ombudsperson or counselor with your healthcare system, you're, you're just hung out to dry in some sense. So those areas, I think, don't fall under the purview of a lot of medical regulations and other kinds of things and are incredibly important to anybody suffering from uh, some health, health issue, like super important. Uh, and then right next door to that are a bunch of issues about your legacy and having conversations with your family and you know all, all that sort of stuff is its own uh, sort of influencer expertise uh, network that I think is is really important. And I would love to see these things exist almost as concierges or guides that hand hand you off to the other and say, oh, 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 if you're interested in this, this, or this, I have I have other advisors who you could maybe work with. And they could form a loose network of 24-7 available, inexpensive or free advice, which I think would be phenomenal. Um, but but again, there's a couple of landmines in there around some of the legal issues and some of the quack medicine uh, that does exist that needs to be fenced somehow or or guarded around or something like that. Yeah, it's, that's that's no problem to fence that. Uh, I mean, you, yeah. you basically put the instructions into the GPT, but then think about, for example, registered dietitians who are uh, uh, counseling patients. So, so they are supposed to put together a, a program of uh, here's what you should eat and instructions. Well, this thing can develop a, a, a menu plan for the week in three seconds, right? And it can it can incorporate that I'm gluten intolerant, I hate uh, broccoli, you know, and, and all those things. So uh, it can completely customize this. So, so uh, professional uh, uh, people can use this, uh, to, to increase their productivity and, and uh, become more effective with patients. And also the system is endlessly patient and has a lot of variety at hand. So you could say, hey, this looks like a really boring ass menu. Could you make it more Asian and spice it up a bit? Um, and it would be like in the same amount of time, it would come up with a completely alternative menu that you might like better. And your nutritionist, if you were asking them to do that, might be like, damn, I'm going to have to charge you an extra three hours to do this or whatever, right? So right. so the, the permutational possibilities and the flexibility of the system is, is stuff that we haven't wrapped our heads around yet. And I love that. I think that's very promising. I think that, I think the more, I fear that our generation smells how wonderful this is. We'll get to experiment with it. We'll do some cool stuff but won't internalize the actual power of it, which people sort of coming of age, let's say an 18 year old today who starts playing with these things and understands it deeply and sees where it goes from here, they're gonna have a different experience of it entirely than, than, than we get to. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sad about, but hey, we were there at the start. <laughs> That's right. Well, the, the, there is one book that comes to mind it, it, it is in the health world. It's uh, Michael Greger's new book on how not to age. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it is a tour de force. I mean, this guy's got 20,000 references, whatever. I mean, it, it's like a fire hydrant. And he really needs to have something. Okay. You, you, it, it just, and he debunks so many things. Um, and, you know, it comes down to some pretty simple things about eating healthy and exercising weight. 
And uh, I mean, there are some supplements and things that he does recommend, but they're very few and he de debunks a lot of them. And I, I, I was thinking, good grief, you know, I mean, I'm reading this and it's just, you know, so much information. He's got videos and I'm still diving into it. But what you want is something that makes it easy. And what you're describing, Klaus, is easy. Nonetheless, easy things aren't easy to implement all the time, to build it into people's lifestyle. Uh, unless you're delivering the, the ingredients of all the food recipes to their homes so they, you know, busy, uh, you know, busy d dual career um, couples, my, my daughter being one of them, barely has time to think about meals, you know? So, I mean... Um, it's difficult, even when you have great technology, it's still difficult to shift the needle and engage people in it. I don't know whether you were referring to Jesse's project when you were talking or something else, but uh, I did look at it a while back. And, um, you know, it's it's all about onboarding. How do you get people activated and engaged to use any technology? And um, Jesse would be right in on this. You're right. Yeah. And this is, this is um, I think, you know, one of the edges we're pushing up against in terms of an informed individual human assessment <laughs> versus all the stuff that might come up in the context of, for want of a better term, you know, machine program, machine learning, um, you know, what's the answer to that? in terms of, in, in the areas that we're talking about, which is, you know, one of, 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 of judgment, observation, um, nuance, um, I don't know, what would you rather rely on? I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud um, also, mm -hmm. right? Um, can we duplicate that, that human piece? <laughs> is the human piece a bunch of crap? I mean, I'm just, you know, um, so there's a bunch of studies coming out that these AIs seem to be have better bedside manner and be more convincing <laughs> than human than humans are, and that's okay. both troubling and exciting. Yes. Um, yeah. 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 Well, I would still come back. Out. Yeah. Well, I would still come back to the synergy aspect of that. I think there's no question that it can be very helpful. I mean, it's very early search where they just gathered data. Uh, gathered data. Uh, mm -hmm. patients about their mental health that in itself was helpful um you know so um this is where it comes back where, where are we going to get this in when does when do we really need the human and there's so much in healthcare where i mean just describing your na your 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 mother's journey without going to the details how to navigate it and um or even particular cancer survivor groups who want to go to uh, you know like website like patients like me or whatever where they learn about things and learn from one another and how could that be enhanced even further um mm -hmm. so that people are much more savvy when they find themselves in a um you know first time with a serious diagnosis how do they manage it and the healthcare system is very limited in what it can do i mean it's you know, it's really messy I mean, it's horrible it is yeah. and, and part of that is because primary care has been completely screwed in this country yeah. Uh, it is, um, I'll have to share a blog post that I wrote on that one about the prejudice against family medicine. <laughs> Let me see if I can find it. <laughs> that, make, that makes yeah. total sense to me. We basically optimized for around profit for the healthcare system. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Bad, it's bad it's outcomes. A, yeah. Yeah. And I'll, Sorry, I'll, Stuart, I'll, go ahead. Yeah. And, and I'll just throw another angle out on that. Um, there's a huge multiple myeloma network in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I have made the conscious choice to stay away from it because my sense is that so many folks have um, chosen to see the disease as a huge part of their identity. Mm. And I wanted to just kind of stay away from that. Now, it may be arrogance on my part. It may be stupidity. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, quote, in remission right now. Uh, the docs say that it always comes back. Sorry, I'm not buying into that. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just not, you know, it's my, it's my, it, you know, it, it, it's my choice. Um, and I don't know, that's just a, another 
another personal take on that on that million. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, I mean, there's a lot of downside as well because let's say um, you become an influencer, you have let's say a few thousand people who are signing up with you. Where does all this data go, right? Um, because you now now you are collecting information about the individual that is hugely personal um and uh on the one hand you want this to be open source right because you want the ai to learn and and become better at uh, providing guidance and support but on the other hand um i don't know how uh, uh you can screen or, or you can shield the individual data points um how can you anonymize this, you know, to the AI? So, um, uh, so, so there's no mischief uh, happening with the data later on. I think that's the the soft spot here. There were two startups. Um, one was called Cure Together. The other one was called Patients Like Me, uh, 2004, 2008. And I was really hopeful about medical data sharing communities. That's the topic I put them under in my in my brain. Um, and I think both of them suffered bad endings, but they started out really well in, in terms of one of them was around ALS victims, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis victims, who were sharing lots of intimate data, more data than, than any HIPAA compliant website could ask for, but you had to have the condition to participate and you uploaded your data. And then they had really good data analysts who were figuring out that, you know, correlations of different conditions and they, they broadened out from ALS to different conditions. And I thought it was really useful. And I'm, I don't know, I think that both of those ended badly. One got bought by 23andMe, which I was surprised to read recently, has had a downward spiral like nobody's business. So 23andMe is practically out of business, is a, it has had a horrible, miserable time for the last decade. And uh, the other one, I don't know exactly what happened to it, but I, I was wishing that uh, that would work. Thanks for finding your post, Rick. Yeah, no, I just added in there. So there is a conference uh, on tomorrow called the Raise Health Symposium, if you're interested. There's a link there, um, which I'm going to go to. It's from 8.30 in the morning to 1. Hey, that's Pacific time. Good grief. <laughs> oh, dim, 8.30. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> well, I'm usually up at 5.30, so maybe I'll make it. Um, but anyway, I mean, to me, this speaks to, the, well, there's two things. One, it's not just the corporatization of healthcare in the United States, which has been absolutely uh, detrimental, but also the, um, call it, you know, the rise of biomedical sovereignty, supremacy of focusing on specialism, which this is what this, this, this uh, it's a Stanford uh, um, symposium. And uh, anyway, it's always good to, to, to see other perspectives, but it's all very much in the high, you know, high tech end of things and very little is focusing on uh, basic healthcare mm -hmm. and, where, and where technology could be helpful. You yeah. know, I, I, I need to run Jerry. Are we going to suspend for a while? What do do? <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to suggest we actually not hold this call until the 17th of June. Okay. Which mm -hmm. is uh, the outside of, of a month. Great. Um, and I will rush to finish my projects. I will try to do some work on Neobooks as well. Uh, but uh, Rick, if uh, if Kent wants to ring the bell or flash the bat signal, then we'll convene for that and just and just yeah. for that topic, which would be great. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, and it hit, could be hit, open to other people. It could be more than just, yeah. you know, you know, promote it with the community as well. Sounds great. Yeah. Sounds great. But other than yeah. that, let's let's meet again on June 17th. I'll put a note to this effect on our Mattermost channel. Um, and I, I thank you because this this actually will win me all of us back a bunch of time, but wins me back some time that I can devote to completing these things. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. Laser well, light show. It's, yeah. it's two. Uh, it's, 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 it's horns. It's, uh, <laughs> it's two horns, uh, Klaus. Yeah, like that. Just hold them up, uh, and you should. Oh come on! Uh, What's it? Why is it not doing? What's going on? I don't know. Anyway, you have, to, you have to have a Mac to do that. This is a this is a Mac. Well, OS it's thing. it's not working on mine. I've got a Mac huh. and it's not I working. I have a Mac. Yeah. Okay, hold up, hold up, hold up a peace sign. Maybe mine's not enabled. Oh, there it is. Okay, so oh, Rick, you know Rick's, is, is, Rick's is working. 
Yeah, it was so the background. Don't it into settings. Yeah, don't hold it too close. Yeah, hold here. Plus, you should work. That's weird. If you hold up, a, if you do a thumbs up, does that work? Yeah, it does. I think yeah, we have pauses, an artificial background. Pauses is not happy. And plus, you're on a Mac, right? Yeah. Must be something into settings somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. Anyhow. Um, all right. I'll let you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Enjoy the sabbatical. No, you're working. Yeah, I know. I'm going to go. I'm going to go dive. Thanks. <laughs>